So hello everybody, my name is uh, Anthony Buckley Thorpe and I'm going to be giving you a presentation today about um, essentially the servicification of parametric design. Uh, we're going to look at some examples of how web services are being revolutionized today by companies like uh, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform and Microsoft Azure Cloud. Um, just to quickly go over the uh, the program for the for the uh, session, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, myself and how I personally got into uh, parametric design. I'm going to talk about Flux, the company, um, and the philosophy that we have on how we are trying to uh, bring a new type of technology, uh, a new implementation of technology, to the um, architecture, engineering, construction industry. We're going to look at the current way that information is uh, exchanged uh, between third parties and parametric designers and then propose um, perhaps a new model for how we could uh, exchange information in the future. Uh, like I just mentioned before, we're going to look at the, uh, the growth of uh, web services, these uh, companies that are truly changing the, the face of the internet uh, and see if there's anything that we couldn't learn from those. We're going to look at uh, what that might mean. Um, so it's all good and well to bring new technologies to the table, but how might that actually benefit uh, construction? Uh, this isn't uh, necessarily thinking about something that's going to happen in the future. There's a lot of evidence all around us that this is already starting to happen. And so I'll go through a few of those looking at uh, existing uh, use cases that I've seen uh, Flux users come across uh, and then other ones just from my time uh, back as a, as a structural engineer. And I want to leave you with a couple of questions uh, moving forwards because this is uh, really you know, something that is a revolution that is still underway and there's a lot of question marks and a lot of things to still be resolved um, and ways that it could change the industry in, in positive and uh, negative ways perhaps. So I'll leave you with a few questions and perhaps that might spur on a, a class discussion for the end of the session. So just to start, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to my background. Um, so I'm a structural engineer uh, by, by training. I studied a master's in civil engineering uh, back in London. Um, I really started out on this uh, project you can see on the right-hand side here um, when I joined Arab London in 2007. Um, this tower, unfortunately, is not going to be built in its uh, current form, but um, it was a really fantastic project to be involved in the design of. It was a, with a, in collaboration with KPF and really very, very intensely uh, using Grasshopper uh, in a time when not a lot of people were, were using Grasshopper. And so that really started to shape my, uh, my direction moving forwards. I started to become a little bit of the Grasshopper guy, you might say. Uh, after that, I moved out to Shanghai, which is a, a great city uh, if you're in architecture. Uh, a lot of big projects, um, a lot of great uh, famous architects out there to be involved with. Uh, and again, when I was out there, started doing a little bit more scripting, started to make my own Grasshopper components, uh, and really trying to support the rest of the team with their own digital workflows. And then after that, I, I really realized that um, digital and parametric designing uh, was was what I wanted to do, uh, not just for 10% of the day, but, but all day, every day. And that led me to uh, move to San Francisco and join uh, my current company, Flux. So for those of you that have not heard of um, Flux, I'll just very quickly introduce the background of the company. It was a project uh, incubated at Google X Labs, so I'm sure you've heard of the uh, driverless car initiatives and things like that. The idea was that uh, construction is facing a huge challenge in terms of urbanization, in terms of carbon emissions, and that perhaps there were ways that technology could be applied to help um, reduce waste and inefficiency in the industry. So. Right now, we're an independent company funded by Google and other venture capitalists. Um, we're just focused on uh, a lot of different ways in which technology can be used to drive efficiency. Um, and I'll, again, show examples of that throughout this presentation. One third of the staff at Flux are people like myself, people from with backgrounds in structural engineering or architecture that are just perhaps very proficient in, in scripting and digital design. And the remaining two-thirds are professional software engineers, so people with, a, with no 
um, specific background in construction, um, but they are particularly motivated by, by the mission. So something you'll hear with Flux is that we're all about uh, data uh, and delivering data in a way that is uh, not file-based. Um, something I, I like to bring up with people is you perhaps speak to a very young person today. They perhaps have no concept of what a file even is anymore. Facebook and Netflix and Uber and all of these day-to-day -day, uh, technologies that we use, no concept of a file anymore. And yet, as soon as you move into architecture and construction, it's .rvt files and .xl files and just files everywhere. It seems a little bit uh, outdated. So looking at dealing with data in this industry, um, there's still some big, some big problems, I, I believe. BIM uh, and parametric design as well, you might say, are making huge uh, steps forward yeah, in terms of digitizing workflows, in terms of making smart, informed decisions and avoiding mistakes. But the problem is there's too many people uh, in the industry still consuming that information in traditional 2D printed format. And as soon as you print those models, these parametric designs out in 2D, you lose all of the logic behind the design, all of the intelligence. Um, and vice versa, when people want to interact with the designer, that they are not proficient in tools like Grasshopper and Dynamo and, and Revit, then they feel disconnected from the design. And that is also, also a shame. Um, the second bullet point here is just really saying that other industries are handling their data in much smarter ways, but that's perhaps because the tools uh, exist for them on a, on a larger scale. If we look at tools that come from Microsoft like SharePoint, um, if, you're, if you're a lawyer and your currency is, is words, then great, you know, Microsoft can move your text data around the web, uh, no problem. If you're in finance, perhaps, then it's all about the numbers and numerical data, not a problem for these systems to be putting on web pages and embedding in emails and, and all of these kinds of things. But for our industry, as architects and engineers, uh, there's a problem because we're really we're all about geometry. And these, again, Microsoft and Oracle proprietary systems, they just fall down. Uh, they don't treat geometry as a first-class citizen. And that's a problem for us. We, we can't then use those tools in the full way in which they're intended. And then the third one here, um, which I think is really important, is that there's currently a very big divide between uh, the two generations uh, of people in construction. You've got the, uh, the more senior people, people maybe five, ten years away from retirement, who have all of the experience. They've built many buildings before. They know what goes wrong. They know about the human element of uh, construction and the relationships needed to, to get things built. But then on the other side, you have the, uh, the younger generation that have mastered these uh, digital tools, the new tools of the industry, I suppose. Um, the older folks, they are not going to take the time to sit down and learn Grasshopper no matter how hard we try. Uh, and likewise, the younger generation, they have to be in the industry for 30, 40 years uh, until they have a, an equal kind of internal database of information in their mind. So we have to find a way to uh, bridge that chasm between these two generations if we're really going to move the industry as a whole forwards. So I actually saw this graphic uh, by somebody else. I think it might have been uh, Nate Miller, who I believe uh, has presented on this uh, lecture series before. So credit uh, to him for this one. But when I first saw it, it really resonated with me uh, when I was still working back at Arup. I really felt like that person on the, on the left there, the big guy. I was the digital person in the office. And when anybody had a coordination problem or some new file type that came in that they couldn't uh, they couldn't open or they couldn't extract the information they required from, then it ended up on my desk. And again, that was all good and well, but I wanted to perhaps start building new scripts or finding ways to uh, improve efficiencies within the office. And I almost became paralyzed with uh, everybody else's problems. And again, it wasn't because they couldn't have learned to solve the problem for themselves. It was just a, it's a big leap to go in and learn all these tools and, and become a parametric or digital designer for yourself. And so I think uh, with, the, with the things that we're creating at Flux, we're trying to um, create a more graded 
uh, distribution of digital skills within design teams. And so it might mean that we have the, uh, the parametric designer who configures workflows and builds those custom components for, for Dynamo or, or for whatever. But then you have the next tier down, the people that are comfortable opening up a Dynamo script or a Grasshopper script and running it on their computer. And maybe they couldn't create that themselves, but they understand what they're feeding in and they understand what's coming out the other side. On the, perhaps a tier below them, there are appified workflows. So that might be, again, scripts, but with a very clean user interface. Um, so you're talking about an interface as clean as Google Maps, uh, maybe just five exposed buttons. You don't need to run anything on your local computer. It's all running in the cloud. So um, again, maybe this, uh, this image will become uh, more clear to you as we go through uh, today's session. And so really the philosophy that we have uh, at Flux and the thing that attracted me to, to join the firm was that it's a platform where geometry is an equal citizen. It's, uh, it's designed for people in construction. And so it's not like we're trying to take somebody else's tool and make it work in our world. Um, the second one is uh, it's about how we connect into existing applications. We don't expect everybody to drop what they're doing and drop you know, their favorite tools, perhaps SketchUp, and then learn something new. Um, there's actually ways that we can use APIs, the, uh, the software development kits of these other tools, and go into them and extract the information that's required so that people can continue to use the tools that they, they're familiar with and that they trust. Then the third point is um, more and more online uh, web apps. So again, not everybody has to be working at the desktop level. And a lot of people are now mobile, they're moving they're out on the job site, they're, they're moving between offices, and more of this, uh, these digital uh, workflows need to be available to them directly in a web browser. And so just to kind of map out uh, the platform, and again, I'm sure you're familiar with this already, but over on the left-hand side, again, the kind of like the historical paradigm, the desktop paradigm, and we need to connect into these uh, existing tools and to extract and, and deliver information back because people will hold on to them tooth and nail uh, for a very long time yet. Over on the right-hand side, at the top uh, right-hand corner, these are the web apps. These are the, the future direction of the industry, I believe, where we can get access to these parametric scripts on demand behind very clean, tidy UI without having to download or install anything and basically put these tools in a much uh, larger group of individuals' hands. Um, bottom right, uh, this is the extensibility of Flux. Uh, and I'll talk, I'll have, I've got a slide at the very end just to kind of touch on that. But it's an extensible platform uh, when you have your own, you want to build your own integration or you want to build your own online app, the, the tools are there for you to do so. And then really at the very center, what is the, the core part of Flux and that is being able to store data online so that we can collaborate and deliver uh, that information to these web apps and to these integrations, not in a file-based uh, format, but in a granular data level. And then also this idea of uh, cloud compute, uh, being able to manipulate data and reformat and restructure data on the fly in the cloud so that nobody has to worry about running scripts on, on their own desktop computers. So for this next uh, short section, I'm just going to look at the way that information is currently exchanged between uh, parametric designers or parametric designers and non-parametric designers and uh, draw a comparison to an example uh, from over 100 years ago. So this is, uh, this is kind of the current way that information is designed between perhaps uh, an architect and a structural engineer, or it certainly was from, from my experience. And that is that perhaps one week the, uh, the architect is manipulating the form of a building, and then on a discrete uh, moment in time, that I would receive perhaps a, a Rhino file or some sort of AutoCAD file uh, on the structural engineering side. I would then open that file, I would move it into my structural analysis software, process it, calculate the sizes of the elements, and then, the, and then send those back over to the architect for them to update their, their BIM model or their, or their 3D Rhino model. So it's a very serial exchange of information architect works for a few days, sends it to me and I work for a few days, sends it back to the architect and hopefully that information is still compatible. 
So very cyclical, uh, but in a, in a serial um, binary way. So this is probably one of the most overused examples uh, in, in parametric design, um, but I still think it is by far the best one uh, out there. That is uh, Anto Antonio Gaudi uh, and the Sagrada Familia uh, Church in Barcelona, Spain. If we actually look at this, uh, this hanging string model, which again, I'm sure you've seen before, but I kind of look at this and think that Gaudi had a parametric script in his own hands. As you can hang off these little weights, these little bags of sand, which represented the weight of the stone of certain elements of the structure, the strings would form and, and move and actually show the, uh, the optimal um, curvature of the building to ensure that everything remained in compression. And really it is, he had a grasshopper script in his hands. He didn't have to, didn't need a computer or anything like that can increase or decrease the weight of the sand in these bags and that uh, that form is going to change directly. But the interesting thing here to note is that Gaudi as the architect, he didn't have to go and ask somebody uh, what the answer would be. He doesn't have to go and speak to a structural engineer or a stonemason and wait for a response. He can, with his own hands, play and tweak uh, the different um, bags of sand and see what the consequence uh, of a particular design um, change might be. And so you might say that over a hundred years ago, uh, he was liberated in, the way, in how he could interact with design in perhaps a way that we've, we've lost um, in, today's, in today's world. Perhaps that was why he was able to create such uh, beautiful and inspiring architecture. So just kind of taking that back to the uh, the current paradigm that I'd introduced a few slides back. So you've got this binary exchange of data, the architect changes the form, but they have no idea what that means for structural element sizes until the arch until the engineer opens that file, runs the analysis and, and sends it back perhaps a, a day or two later. Well, what if we could uh, wire these two different desktops together? Because the funny thing is the architect is using parametric design to shape the, the, the form of the building. And on the right hand side, the, uh, the structural engineer is using parametric design to automate the uh, sizing of different elements. Well, if we could use some way of wiring these workflows up together so that these scripts in different uh, computers and different formats could just start speaking to each other, then the architect could be getting automated responses and perhaps the, uh, the, the engineer could go and take a vacation and uh, the job would be being done for them automatically. Now, this isn't to say that structural engineering can be automated, and it's certainly something that I wouldn't subscribe to, but certainly when we are just iterating through design options, um, there is a lot to be had here. The architect can explore the implications of making a design modification, and so it means that when the architects and the engineer come together for their in-person design meeting, it's going to be a much more productive um, workshop because the architect has been able to explore different options and raise new questions um, rather than it just be uh, everybody operating uh, totally blind to the, the consequences. And so there's an example of an architecture firm in London um, that I was speaking to and it really blew me away when I heard about it. It was um, there was a structural, sorry, there was an architect who was, uh, they wanted to work right the way through the night. They were, it was a design competition. They wanted to do 10 different options of building massing um, to make sure that they really, you know, wowed the client and won the project. All these different building massings meant that uh, things like daylight analysis and shadow analysis had to be conducted for it to be a valid design. And that work was being conducted by a, a third party consultant, um, essentially a, uh, a daylight consultant or something like this. But they obviously didn't want to work uh, all night. They were just providing a service. Uh, there was no, nothing in their interests for the architect to iterate through the design and win the project. And what the architect proposed was, okay, well, a lot of what you're doing, uh, Mr. Daylight Analysis Guy, was just parametric design, a script that you'd already configured and set up for my specific project. So what if you just left your computer on overnight 
and I could send data and receive data from it automatically. So we bypass the, uh, the risk of the consultant having to give the script to the architect because perhaps they wouldn't set it up correctly or they don't have the correct plugins uh, or packages installed for it to function as intended. It's also that person's intellectual property. Um, maybe that's why the architect pays them a fee and they don't want to give them the, uh, their secret source, their secret recipe. But what they did was, uh, just using Flux, was that the architect could send the raw geometry via the web to the, uh, the consultant's computer. It would automatically run that parametric script and send back the shadow analysis results uh, again over the web to the architect. And so it was a really interesting new way that these two parties were collaborating with one another. They'd essentially broken out of an individual desktop environment uh, in terms of parametric design, started connecting parametric scripts together, kind of creating a much larger uh, intelligent system. And so I was really excited to hear about this um, and what that had uh, enabled the architects uh, to do. So based on this example of uh, new ways of people collaborating using digital scripts, uh, connecting these scripts together, I wanted to also share a bit of a personal experience of how I arrived at a somewhat similar workflow uh, on, a, on a live project. This is a project, it's called the Hangzhou Comic uh, Museum. You can kind of see comics, the, these bubbles look like speech bubbles. Uh, that was the way that the architecture was intended to, to be uh, designed. It was a project with MVRDV, um, but being constructed uh, in Hangzhou is just a, a couple of hours outside of Shanghai. It's a really, really uh, interesting project, very, very complicated in terms of the relationship between form and structural engineering. And so with a colleague, um, we created on the Arab side of the fence uh, a very, very advanced um, workflow where we could receive in new 3D geometry uh, of, these, of these bubble forms and iterate through creating a structural parametric model through running um, actual the analysis and applying wind loads, calculating the size of elements and feeding that all the way back uh, into the Rhino file and, and also creating automated uh, drawings. Um, really, really fantastic uh, automated workflow, but again, it was only automated on the Arab or the structural engineering uh, side of the, of the workflow. There was no way that the architect could have directly interacted with this workflow uh, without the intervention of a structural engineer. And so it meant that the certain forms would be modified, holes would be cut in the structure. Uh, and again, the architect would not know the implication of the result in terms of element sizes and so in terms of um, deflections and things like that until we ran this whole process and got back to them with some uh, information. Another example uh, is this project, it was the uh, Yongsan uh, development in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, this again was another MVRDV project that I, I worked on uh, and I was responsible for the design of this cloud structure that connected these two residential towers. And as the architect was going through uh, schematic and design development, the program was changing and so this cloud, this pixelated cloud structure was always changing week by week. And so I designed a way that I could automate the creation of structural models uh, based on what they were giving me. And uh, I actually did this one within uh, Excel using some VB scripts. Uh, I think Excel is a fantastic tool. You don't have to do everything in Grasshopper and Dynamo. Uh, Excel still holds its, uh, holds its own in certain ways. But again, the architect had no idea what it meant when they extended the length of a cantilever what that might have meant for you know how many uh, diagonal braces they were going to get in a in a certain plane, and so again moving forwards with parametric uh, digital design methods, but the people that are responsible for making decisions, they are disconnected. They are one step removed from realizing the uh, the impact of the changes that they make. And so it came to this project. Uh, this is a uh, Raffles City, Chongqing. It's a Moshe Safdi uh, project uh, in, a, in a city in Western China that I was involved with. 
And I was responsible for the structural design coordination of uh, these eight towers. The, the size and scale of the project was really uh, mind-boggling. Uh, over one million square meters of real estate, uh, five billion dollar uh, project. So really at an absolutely incredible scale, you can imagine the amount of coordination, the amount of digital models that were involved. And so, like always, I, I would figure out ways that I might be able to automate the uh, movement of 3D design information uh, that we receive from the architect and start automatically generating our structural models so that every, every week or every couple of weeks when the, when the curvature of the buildings would be modified, to uh, perhaps facilitate better program layout that I could just click a few buttons and regenerate my structural models and regenerate the, the structural element sizes. Uh, right the way through to even creating my own custom um, uh, grasshopper components. But again, the problem was it was still one step removed from the architect. The, the architect over in, in Boston, the structural engineers in Shanghai, we were still exchanging data in a very serial way, no matter how much we automated our own processes. And then something interesting happened, um, and that was I, I got an opportunity to go out to Boston for a design coordination workshop and uh, really got to see how the architect was operating um, behind the, uh, the AutoCAD files and the Revit files. And uh, I was walking around the office for, for a tour and I, I kind of bumped into my my counterpart, you might say, one of the digital designers on the on the uh, architect side, and I saw that they were using Grasshopper to uh, lay out the the curvature of the buildings, and I said, "Well, this is interesting because you know I'm using Grasshopper to size some of the elements based on the constraints of how these different mega columns could, were being put together." And we said, "Well, you know, why are we both using Grasshopper and then we're exchanging information?" in Excel or in you know PDF kind of tabulated format, wouldn't it be interesting if we actually just shared uh, our Grasshopper scripts with one another? And one of the key um, things that we, we thought about doing was the example of these mega column geometries. From a structural engineering standpoint, the thing that I really cared about was the cross-sectional area of that column. That was what really dictated the maximum compression force that the column could take. Um, however, I didn't really care whether it was a square column or whether it was a chamfered column. Um, I just really cared about the uh, the total area. I had a couple of other requirements in that it couldn't be just a, a perfect triangle. Um, that wasn't going to be as efficient uh, for my requirements. But, you know, there was a lot of variables that I had a wide range of um, kind of tolerance on. And the way that we'd been working to date was that I would pro propose a square column and the architect would say, hey, can we chamfer that? It makes more logical sense for the bathroom layouts. And I'd say, sure, we could do it like this and send it back. But it was, again, it was a, a binary exploration of the design space. But through seeing uh, and connecting with the uh, parametric designer on the architectural firm side, I said, look, I can actually just give you a grasshopper script with the variables that I, I can accept a variance of, and you can you can vary these things. You can vary the the chamfer size, but the dimensional size of the column, and I'll just make sure that it meets the uh, the minimum uh, cross sectional area. You can see down in the uh, Excel sheet how that was uh, monitored. So it wasn't like the example we saw before, where the scripts were connected via the web. It was actually just a, a significant amount of trust between the people involved with the design and just packing up a grasshopper script and, and giving it to the uh, to the architect so that they could freely explore the design space. But it really got me thinking a lot about what that might mean um, for the future of structural design. Maybe I could be providing a better structural service by not just giving structural element sizes, but actually giving all possible structural element sizes in the form of grasshopper script. Um, and so, again, I think this is uh, kind of a really key component of the presentation that I'm giving you uh, today. So back at my time uh, with, with the team in Arab Shanghai, um, we were doing some really fantastic stuff. We had some really amazing architectural projects we were working on, 
a lot of opportunity to employ uh, parametric design uh, workflows. And it led me one day to uh, actually mapping out all of the internal connections that we could do. We were always looking for ways that we could streamline the movement of data from one application to another. Um, and we really wanted to let everybody in the team know what was possible. Because like I mentioned right at the beginning of this presentation, not everybody is a parametric designer, but it's important for parametric designers to advertise their services, let's say, or advertise what can be done so that people ask the right questions at the right time. And so this was the uh, this was a map. Uh, again, this is quite a few years ago now, but it kind of showed all of the different um, software applications that we were using in the team. It kind of showed how you can go or, or tried and trusted methods of going from one application to another. And so perhaps um, we would receive a SketchUp file from an architect, and I knew that I could take that into Rhino, and I could mesh that in HyperMesh and use that to generate you know, structural analysis file, et cetera, et cetera, and then really end up at a Revit or an AutoCAD or an Excel file, which would be then shared back with that, that uh, external collaborator. But um, it was really interesting because it showed as well the, the weaknesses in our workflows. You could see that the dashed lines were things that we knew were possible, but they weren't particularly well um, tried and tested and, you know, fully solidified. So it really led us to have a a real handle on the inner workings of digital design within the uh, structural engineering team. Um, and again, really helped us understand where we could invest uh, time and effort uh, to take things forward. And we had a lot of conversations with the office in Hong Kong and the office in Beijing because we realized that we were all trying to solve the same problems. And then we'd end up on the phone with uh, the teams down in Australia and the UK and, and the US. And um, again, this is not problems that are being faced in isolation. It's uh, a very common problem. It's uh, just not been uh, properly looked at and resolved yet. And that kind of leads into uh, insight from a parallel industry, um, which I think is very relevant now. And this is a revolution in web services that has only really taken hold over the last uh, few years, I guess. Um, I'm sure everybody's probably started to hear about things like AWS, Amazon Web Services. Uh, maybe you're starting to hear more about Google Cloud Platform and Microsoft Azure Cloud. It's this idea that we don't need to um, run our own servers anymore, and we don't need to figure out how to do data analytics. We can actually just go to these other firms and just use them directly. We can just buy them as uh, on-demand services uh, in the form of, again, APIs or application programming interfaces. But how was it that these firms arrived at this new business model of providing online web services? Well, it really came from Amazon. They really pioneered this approach. They'd built this very complex, um, you know, online shopping platform and they'd integrated it with their warehouses and inventory management and every time somebody started creating a new you know, business unit they would need to think about okay how are we going to you know structure our database how are we going to interact with that database uh, via the web and Jeff Bezos started to say look why don't we uh, actually start servicifying in these internal um, these internal uh, services, I guess, uh, to reuse the word, so that as people start up new business units, we don't have to solve the same problem again. And I think that solving the same problem again is the thing that we are doing too much in architecture and construction. It's the, the whole Rhino to Revit workflow. Everybody solved it a hundred times in a hundred different ways. And was that really necessary? So you might call it infrastructure as a service. Um, this is a, a quote here, I'll just read it. Uh, so the internal teams at Amazon required a set of common infrastructure services everybody could access without reinventing the wheel every time. So talking about, again, databases, uh, web interfaces, things like that. And that's precisely what Amazon set out to build. And that's when they began to realize they might have something bigger. So as Amazon restructured internally its uh, digital services, to help other business units as the company was rapidly growing, 
they realize that, well, actually now we've servicified these, uh, these different components. There's no reason why we couldn't start selling this to other people that are not inside Amazon who are facing similar challenges. Maybe we're talking about Spotify who need to manage a database of music and deliver that in different regions uh, in real time to everybody streaming music. Um, really, really interesting insight. And now they have a multi-billion dollar uh, business in terms of providing these online data services. Um, I was just up in Seattle uh, a couple of weeks ago with a friend who works for AWS and he's saying that they just cannot scale fast enough. They're, the amount of storage that they need to purchase to allow everybody moving to the cloud at such incredible pace. Um, and it's really what's also stirred Google and, and Microsoft to really play catch up um, in, this, in this space. We actually look at the AWS website. You can see that they have this uh, product offering. So they're offering database, they're offering networking, online compute, mobile services, uh, web app development um, services, messaging. Can you hopefully start to see the, uh, the parallel with our industry? You know, I have a Grasshopper script for sizing columns. I have a Grasshopper script for rationalizing a doubly curved surface. I have another Grasshopper script to um, maybe panelize uh, certain services with hexagons. Um, what if these were just on-demand services? Maybe other people will be using them in a way that we don't appreciate right now, but we could achieve our own um, kind of chain reaction, our own uh, kind of fusion uh, within the industry of, of how we could be building these things and networking them together and not having to start, start from scratch every time. Again, Google Cloud Platform, same things, big data, machine learning. These are now services provided on demand. I've seen uh, some really cool examples of people applying Python machine learning in Grasshopper. And it's think, you know it's making me think that, okay, what, what about, though, if you could just hook your Grasshopper script to that Google Cloud Platform directly and let Google do what they're good at and let you do what you're good at and again, just start leveraging all these different services off one another. So with this in mind, what might the, uh, the future of the industry look like for us in, uh, in architecture and construction? Well, I think we've moved from an era now where the design team, you might say the architect is the kind of the key central nexus of design coordination, was balancing up in architectural intent, client requirements, and structural mechanical requirements, just using documents and drawings <clears throat> on a very, again, that very binary, uh, binary way of sharing information before. But the reality in today's world, and this wasn't the case for Gaudi 100 years ago, is that that design team, that architect, is now balancing up an ever-increasing number of requirements. Working in a new country, things like local cultures and practices, maybe future tenant requirements, you're going for lead objectives, you're going for wind tunnel analysis, it's, it's never going to stop growing. And so how can that same design team, that, that architect as a design coordinator, start pulling together and synthesizing so many different uh, requirements? Well, maybe parametric scripts for all of these different requirements providing, provided via the web on demand are the way that that might, that might happen. So what about we talk about sharing logic and not files? And again, I said with Flux, we say share data, not files. And here I'm kind of maybe looking ahead to the future and sharing logic, not files. How are we currently sharing information between individuals? And how much, kind of recognizing how much of that information is lost as a result of sharing it in a static model or even 3D models are, are still static information uh, and data sets. Would it be possible for designers to better synthesize so many of these requirements if they could, uh, again, just tweak results and get uh, responses within milliseconds and maybe you tweak something for the fire requirements, but then it means that the, uh, the, the total area for the client is, uh, is reduced and not satisfied anymore have a much more dynamic interaction of all of these different um, on-demand services to arrive at the optimum design. And then finally, 
we do need to ask, you know, will, will designers share access uh, to these, these design scripts? Yes, it's, it's kind of nerve-wracking that you're going to be allowing somebody to play around directly with your own, your own script, but I, I feel that this is a really an inevitable movement, an inevitable shift within the industry, and uh, people that don't provide their services in these ways to one another will quite simply no longer be um, relevant or, or used in the industry. So let's look at a couple of, um, again, real-life use cases. Um, this is a mixture of uh, Flux users uh, and, um, and others about how they are servicifying their design scripts uh, to enhance design. So <clears throat> one of the very first things I'd seen uh, being used with Flux, and I always thought how people would use it to go from one application to a different type of application, but actually it started being heavily used <clears throat> excuse me, um, by students in, I think it was a university in Madrid, where they were like, well, this is great. Now we can have 20 people all interacting with their dynam with their uh, grasshopper scripts. So I'm going to, I generate the baseline geometry. Somebody else parametri kind of parametrically divides up that surface and does something else. So all of these different individual desktop computers running grasshopper are now speaking to one another in real time. So again, breaking out of, that idea of having a single be-all and end-all script uh, and actually having this thing networked. This was another example of, uh, again, taking the algorithm out of the design tool and, and running it in the cloud. So on the right-hand side here, you can see um, I'm moving the doorways um, to a kind of compartmentalized skyscraper floor plate and calculating in real time the escape distances to the uh, fire escape door uh, in the central core. So as I move the uh, as I move the doorways in Rhino, that information gets sent up to Flux. Flux recalculates the shortest path and sends that back down to uh, Rhino. So again, it's now an on-demand service. The Rhino user doesn't need to set up shortest path distances. They just need to speak to that um, Flux service. And if you have ever built these kind of scripts, uh, hopefully this will resonate with you, but as soon as I'd made that script, that, that fire escape distance script for Rhino, I could actually use it in Dynamo. So it didn't matter what my, uh, my user was using for their core uh, design tool. They just send off those um, requirements to Flux and get the, re get the response back in whichever application it is that they are, they are working in. So we now have, again, shortest path on demand on the cloud. Another workflow I, I, I prototyped, uh, there's a video uh, for this on, on the web on YouTube, but it was about how could I allow the architect to explore column location layouts without always having to ask me, okay, what is the new beam design um, kind of layout? What is the, um, you know, the beam, the, the span to depth ratio? What is the depth of the beam if I do this? So here you can see, this, uh, this Flux project running on the cloud on the right-hand side, and unbeknownst to the architect, they they're, they're not logged in to Flux. They're not looking at that web um, that web uh, interface. It's just closed. They are just using Dynamo on the left-hand side and moving things around, and things are dynamically getting updated and sent back. So again, it's this calibrated design environment, it's an interactive um, uh, sandbox. You might you might say. Another example, perhaps the architect moves one of these columns, um, perhaps again for layout or something. Data gets sent up to Flux and processed according to the structural engineer's requirements and, and sent back. You can see here that it's set up in such a way that pink indicates that they have breached the maximum uh, span. So again, that means that the architect, sorry, the structural engineer can get in and say, okay, we can negotiate, we can change the span to depth ratio, but as a result, I'll give you a larger maximum span. So again, not exchanging files here, just modifying data within um, preferred applications. And now we have this real-time interaction of services uh, between different design parties, much more dynamic way of designing and exploring um, the design space. And finally, even down to you know, auto-generating uh, structural framing layouts. And again, this automated uh, parametric script made available on demand to the architect. Um, 
it maybe it doesn't provide perfect layouts every time, but if it can at least be you know 90% of the way there, then the architect can continue to explore design options before they have to wait for the structural engineer to check their email and, and do some work and, and respond. So I think this was a really interesting uh, prototype uh, workflow of how people might start working together in the future. There was an example from the Acadia uh, Hackathon, which was held in Cincinnati in 2015 that we attended. Um, there's a obviously the sister organization, Cadria, for um, Asia and, and Australasia. Um, so in this particular winning, winning entry actually for the hackathon, these two participants, they used Flux to package up a Grasshopper script, send it via the web to a virtual computer running Rhino in the cloud, again using AWS, where it could then open up that script, run the analysis result and send the response back. So it meant that wherever they were in the world, where they were using their uh, lightweight uh, laptops, they could actually be running a very heavy running Grasshopper script on a more powerful machine in the cloud and then just getting the results back on demand. Um, it also meant that their colleagues could just send off Grasshopper scripts to be run in a different environment and, and sent back. So again, this servicification of how people access and utilize um, Grasshopper scripts. Very, very interesting workflow. I recommend that you uh, you check out the link and watch the full video for that presentation. It's a really great, really great one. And so it's time to wrap up this uh, this presentation. I want to kind of again wrap up with three key takeaways. Um, and again, hopefully these are maybe things that you could discuss uh, after this uh, video is finished. So the first one is, do we think that there will be an AWS equivalent for computational design in architecture, engineering, construction? Can we learn to build on one another's work? Is it that we just haven't really tried to implement this kind of on-demand uh, servicification of um, parametric scripts yet? Or is it uh, a resistance, uh, perhaps as, as designers and creators, that we don't want to use each other's scripts? or we, we don't build scripts in a way that they could be modularized and um, sufficiently uh, exchanged as, as modules. I think that's, a, that's really interesting. Is, that, is, it, is this a human problem or is this a, a technological problem? So that's, that's point one. Number two is uh, what will it mean to share these uh, parametric scripts with one another rather than discrete design information? So again, that project that we, we looked at, the uh, the one in Chongqing, China, where uh, I'd shared the parametric script to design the column rather than a column design. You know, will that lead to greater satisfaction? Will that lead to better design? Or is there a risk that um, design will become overly modularized and, and standardized? And again, everyone's worried about cookie cutter architecture. Um, again, is that the case or will we create something better? Then number three is, again, speaking more to the industry and perhaps when you all move out into these uh, these firms and, and take up roles as digital designers, you could really start to ask yourself this. But, you know, will these traditional design firms, people that are just, you know, project-based, they design one building, then they design another building, maybe one day they'll start, you know, turning into Amazon in the way that they reach out, they kind of expand out from their just day-to-day -day kind of very traditional way of working to also offer digital services to less sophisticated firms or even parts of the industry that were never going to be able to make that leap uh, for themselves and that we might create entirely new business models uh, as a result. Um, but also most importantly, putting, the, putting these tools, putting these powerful digital design tools in the hands of everybody within the design firm and perhaps seeing them used in ways that uh, we'd never before imagined. And so I'd mentioned that I was going to loop back to this uh, infographic, and so again, this is uh, the, op the optimal time, I think, to do that. If we can move from the paradigm where we currently stand on the left-hand side, which is that you know parametric giant within the office doing everything on their own computer, and everybody else remaining in this kind of primitive, prehistoric uh, stage, Maybe we could be using technologies uh, to move to this new paradigm where 
there is a the, the 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 power of that design that digital designer is radiating out across the firm and across the project and others are becoming empowered in terms of using some of the tools they create for themselves and then having a much more digitally literate design team as a whole uh, and again um, leading to better design which I think is what uh, motivates all of us uh, in the industry and so yeah that's uh, that's really the end of the presentation I just wanted to take this last uh, uh, half a minute just to let you know that um, Flux is a you know it's a it's a service it's uh, it's free for educational use it's always been free for educational use and so hopefully everybody can get access to that through our website um, but that you can also develop on Flux you can build your own web apps and we didn't look at any web apps today but you can find them all there online Flux is free to develop on you don't need to pay for access to the SDKs uh, predominantly because we've taken a very again, googly approach to, to things where we just open source these technologies um, through providing access, uh, free and unlimited access uh, to some of these tools. Hopefully we're going to really leave our, our mark on the industry, which is certainly what um, motivates uh, me. So you can uh, take a look at that web link there for further information. And so, yeah, thank you very much everybody for your uh, time and attention uh, today. Um, I hope that uh, I'll get an opportunity to come and visit uh, you in Australia at some point in the near future and perhaps take questions. But feel free to um, either email me at the address here or you can even tweet at me directly. Uh, but I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that have been raised um, from, from this presentation today and I, I hope you've in, enjoyed it. So uh, good luck. I think the, the future's in your hands. And uh, I don't think there's ever been a more interesting time to be involved with the uh, architecture and construction industry. So uh, again, thank you for your attention.